Let me just go ahead and uh, welcome you all to the 15th annual MIT CUIQ Symposium. I'm one of your co-directors, Robert Lutton, and we, will have, we have aligned the best of the best speaking with you today and over the next three days. We have a lot to review before our first exciting keynote, so with that, let me go ahead and begin. As I said, I'm one of the co-directors, and it's a pleasure working with the team to pull this amazing data leadership symposium together for you. If this is your first time attending the MIT CDO IQ Symposium, welcome. You're among family and friends in our data community. This year, again, we've had to hold the symposium virtually, but it is our hope that next year we will be back on site at MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. You're all welcome. This year, our symposium has a theme of deliver mature data and analytics capabilities for ROI. We have over 80 sessions spread over three days. These sessions are being live streamed to over 60 countries and are being recorded for playback over the next 30 days in the same Hoover platform that you're in now. Obviously, you have successfully noticed that we have a new platform called Hoover, one that includes a community interactive feature. There are many features here, and this is our first time using this platform. We're pleased with what we've seen so far, but there are a couple of key points. First, this is an engagement platform. So have fun. Remember that we're all family here, a distributed family. And this offers us a chance to connect with old friends and make new acquaintances. Also, please note on the left-hand side, our sponsor link. These are not sponsored, vir uh, sponsored virtual booths this year. We decided to do something totally different. We would like our attendees to go and click on the left-hand side and view our sponsors who are our partners in the business. Please drop by and visit them. And we'll discuss more information on that shortly. Again, we ask that you help make the hashtag MIT CDO IQ, the trend of the day and the week. Please go ahead and tweet and post and help make some noise. Last year, we announced the creation of the Global Country CDO Ambassador Program. We're pleased to confirm that we've acquired several outstanding ambassadors in their uh, country of origin who are growing the local community. We still have many countries that we're looking for a country CDO ambassador. If you have any interest in understanding what this involves, please send an email to cdoiq at mit.edu. We again will post an announcement on that so you can get a hold of that email as it will be an important email. That email again is cdoiq at mit.edu. We're also announcing the CDO Data for Good Awards that the country CDO ambassadors are involved with. These CDO Data for Good Awards align with the United Nations 16 categories of sustainable development goals. There is a nomination process that is being opened. And after several months, once there are several nominations in each category, it will be open to the public for voting. The country CDO ambassadors will then determine the winner for this. And you'll hear more information uh, as we proceed through the symposium next couple of days on that. And this is for our attendees out there. A big thank you. As you know, our mission in creating the symposium is to create a place for sharing and exchanging of cutting edge ideas, content and discussions. Our purpose is to advance the knowledge and accelerate the adoption of the role of the chief data officer in all industries and geographical locations. Clearly, with 62 countries represent, represented, we appear to be doing something right. And on behalf of, our, of the symposium, we'd like to thank all our partners for their continued support of this virtual conference over the last two years. Before we read out the uh, partners, we'd like to ask again that all our attendees during the next three days take some time out of their schedule to visit the Sponsor Center and our partner pages. And the Sponsor Center partners have uploaded videos and data sheets for you to learn more about how they can help you on your transformation journey. 
You'll be hearing more from our sponsors during the breaks, so be sure to tune in. In addition, some of our, uh, some of our partners are offering prizes or the chance to win a prize uh, should you uh, discover uh, what it is during these videos. So please do watch their videos uh, to see if there's any kind of uh, possibility of winning a prize. It's important to let you know that it's through the support of our partners that we can continue to make the symposium possible. So we, with that, I'd like to thank Privacy Analytics, Accenture, Databricks, Deloitte, Informatica, OneTrust, PwC, Tamer, Abinishu, Calibra, Dowix, Fusion Alliance, KPNG, Sandal Consultants, SAP, Your Data Connect, Accessor, Alation, Ali Data, Big ID, Bumi, Caserta, Data Kitchen, Donoto, Eckerson Group, Explorium, Global ID, Skyhouse, London Stock Exchange, Akira, Pilog, Click, Starburst, ThoughtSpot, and Zaloni. So, our executive team, we have had a lot of help in putting this symposium together, but we'd especially like to extend our thanks to Dr. Rich Wang, Doug Laney, and Steve Wanamaker, who have also been part of the executive team for this year. In addition, we'd also like to thank our 2021 program committee. I should note here that this is the first time we've had so many volunteers and it's great to see them. These volunteers have supported the symposium with their time and effort and we thank you all. Also, next year, if you're interested in helping the symposium and want to learn more about the requirements of being a program committee member, again, please send an email to cdoiq at mit.edu. And of course, as I've got a little bit of time here, I'm going to thank Mark, Dan, Derek, Maria, James, Ivan, John, Doug, Carl, Michael, Nino, Peter, Peter, Bob, Salima, and Sammy. You guys have been absolutely great. Now, the way that we have done this this year is that each track is supported by the MIT uh, video production team as well as our track producers. Our track producers will be on every session for the track and again has, have given us the most amazing gift of all their time. We would like to thank each one of you for your upcoming contributions. Dr. Peter Aiken, Wuyong, Dr. Wuyong Chung, I believe, Wayne Eckerson, Derek Strauss, and Carl Gerber. Thank you very much indeed. And so no one can do it by themselves. We're thankful to have such fantastic partners in Dame International, the International Society of Chief Data Officers, and CDO Magazine. And with that, I'm delighted to introduce the founder and the creator of the MIT CDO IQ Symposium, a person who continues to lead the charge and impact the world on data leadership. My friend, Dr. Rich Wang, Executive Director of the MIT CDO IQ Program. Dr. Wang. Thank you, Robert, and welcome to MIT. MIT Symposium is part of the MIT CDO IQ program that I direct. Our, we have a new website, cdoiq.mit.edu, which is not easy to get, and we got it. Uh, I'm very thrilled that privacy analytics and Accenture have joined MIT CDO IQ program as consortium members supporting our research and practice, including the symposium, and of course, in addition to other sponsors of the symposium. MIT CDO IQ program conducts rigorous and pragmatic research, in addition to providing training and symposiums around the world. In terms of pragmatic research, we are advancing data leadership management, such as this symposium, and the CD, CXO forums, uh, and uh, we are developing an MIT CDOIQ toolkit uh, for CDOs. Most of the time, CDOs need to provide a solution to an ad hoc situation or an unexpected crisis for decision-making uh, with a very short notice. Our idea, is to create a toolkit based on commercial softwares 
that we can leverage that, and so that CDOs can put in action in a very short time, uh, say three or four days or even overnight to provide the necessary data essential and critical to decision makers. In terms of rigorous research, we are collaborating with C officers to learn how CDO can improve their organizational performance. We're conducting CEO versus CDO research forums uh, to learn the expectations from CEO to CDOs and to distill critical re uh, reflections of CDOs so uh, we can, uh, we can uh, present this results to future symposiums. We are investigating the concept of data washing machines, pretty much, pretty much like the washing machines, which one of the session will be session 11C from two to three o'clock in the afternoon, July 21, which is tomorrow. You'll find it disorganized, but interesting and thought provoking. Robert, next slide, please. We plan to host the inaugural MIT CDO IQ European Symposium 22 in Switzerland. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, uh, Robert Abate, uh, Christian Legner, and CJ, CJ uh, are helping out as co-chairs, as well as a few uh, sponsors already signed up to help the Europeans to do this MIT CDO IQ Symposium with the European style in European time. And uh, this will, we will provide the details in a, a closing town hall session on day three. Robert Abate will lead the charge. Next slide, please. And we will continue to offer our Foundation for Chief Data Officers course at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock, uh, where I am actually a professor. And as well as the ongoing CD1 training program that I have offered for the last three years. And uh, the next CD1 training program will be held virtually on September 28th to 29th this year. And as an attendee or speaker, you get 20% discount. Offer expire at end of July. On that note, I would like to pass on to Professor Stuart Manick, my best friend and my best supporter for a lifetime for 40 years. Stu, please. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to add my welcome this morning. Uh, this photograph, by the way, you see was not one I selected. It's one that <laughs> Professor Rich Wang found somewhere. But in many ways, it, it's fairly appropriate because what I want to talk about is a brief bit of history. So I guess this might be appropriate. Next slide, please. So many of you may be attending the CDIOQ conference for the first time, or even if you've attended it several times, you might not know the full history of it. It actually goes back over 34 years to around 1988, when Rich Wang and I created, we call the Total Data Quality Management Program. Now, I don't know how many of you go back that far or remember back that far, but that was an era with TQM, Total Quality Management, was a big movement in manufacturing and production. And we made the observation, well, if you're worried about improving the quality of manufactured goods, data is a manufactured good also. And it kind of launched the whole focus on the notion of data quality. Then around 2000, and that served that kind of as an academic basis for a lot of the subsequent research on that topic. Then around 2003, we started to realize this was spilling over into the industry and we formed the, the early MIT IQ information quality program to address the industry's need for high quality data. And then of course in 2008, we started the MIT CDO IQ program and the symposium. And of course, one thing I should mention in this transition in 2009, many don't realize it, that Rich Wang served as the first chief data quality officer for the US Army. Next slide, please. So in addition to my history of the CDO IQ Composium, I'd like to give you a little bit of history of how that connects with MIT. Because we especially appreciate you, as Robert mentioned at the beginning, these are clearly very challenging times. Next. 
But of course, changing and challenging times are not new to MIT. Uh, as some of you may not realize, MIT was actually founded in April 10th, 1861. Next. But then what happened on April 12th, 1861? This is one of those few things that I wasn't around for. That was the start of the United States Civil War, which continued until April 9th, 1865. So MIT's first classes were not held until 1865. Next. So by the way, those interested, this is the building MIT was based in in Boston back in 1865. Your attendance here at the CDA OIQ conference indicates that disruption we think is almost over. Let's hope for that. Next. And this is the MIT logo, which is men's ed minus. Now my final duty this morning is to induce a excellent person and happens to be my boss, Professor Michael Cusimano, who's also the deputy dean of the MIT Sloan School of Management, a professor of management, and more particularly is a professor of technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, and strategic management. The one thing I consider particularly important, to the best of my knowledge, he is the first dean we have had at the MIT Sloan School who is actually working on IT-related topics. He is also a regular columnist for the communication of the ACM, the major journal for the computer science field. And uh, in 2009, he was named one of the most influential people in technology and IT by technology news website, silicon.com. But to give you some further information and welcome, I'm gonna ask him to talk a little bit about his latest book on platform strategy for the age of digital competitions. Without any further ado, my good friend, Dean Michael Cusimano. Okay, thank you, Stuart. And I am old enough and have been at MIT long enough to remember the old uh, data quality uh, uh, initiatives in the 1980s. I've been at MIT since 1986. So yes, I also want to extend my welcome to all of you coming to MIT. And um, as uh, Professor Madnick noted, we've been studying computers and all different aspects of them for many years, going back to the 1930s. Um, some early research on digital circuits, but really software and networks, time sharing, um, a variety of applications. And a lot of us have been interested as well in new enabling technologies. And I can early remember uh, learning about object-oriented programming in an MIT uh, class that I was auditing back in the 1980s. But data encryption, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and more recently quantum computing are also areas that uh, uh, my colleagues and I have been looking at very closely at MIT, not only the underlying science and technology, but the, the business implications. More recently, um, MIT launched the Schwarzman College of Computing in 2020. This is a billion dollar plus investment uh, to diffuse knowledge of computing and expertise and applications and, and artificial intelligence, but particularly the ethical uh, implications of these technologies. Uh, so we've created 50 new faculty positions or will create them over time uh, throughout MIT, not just housed in the, the the computer science department, although uh, the Schwarzman College is really an umbrella organization uh, for a bunch of these efforts. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now this, this is the new book that uh, Professor Maddick mentioned. I was asked to say a few words about it, the business of platform strategy in the age of digital competition, innovation and power. Uh, this is just a downloaded description of the book, so I don't want to spend time on that, but let's go to the next slide, and I'll just uh, give a few tidbits of what we looked at. So the basic issue is that digital platforms and the data that drive them are everywhere. This is the way we organize technology today. So computers, obviously, but going into all the different mobile devices and applications, the underlying uh, technologies like microprocessors, messaging, payments, social media, web service, internet of things. These are all what we call platform technologies. Uh, if you can click again on the slide. Uh, the other point that many of these platforms exist alongside or on top of other platforms. And obviously this creates enormous complications. 
for building more applications, but also security. Can I have the next slide, please? So one of the things that we did in our book is to try to bring some uh, structure and organization to this. So we actually divide all platforms uh, into two types. Uh, innovation platforms are the oldest that I began to study really in the late 1980s. Uh, uh, these are operating systems and associated hardware technologies that serve as a foundation for the uh, parent company as well as third party companies to build applications and services that make that core platform technology or product increasingly valuable as there are more of these uh, outside innovations. So we call that that feedback loop uh, network effects. So everyone's familiar obviously with Windows and before that uh, IBM mainframe uh, operating systems and associated technologies. But today we have a whole bunch of different innovation platforms including something like Amazon Web Services, where people build applications for the web uh, and have a little uh, API where they can actually uh, get exposure to artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, algorithms that they can embed into their applications. But the other type of platform that people have talked about since the internet in particular are transaction platforms. And these are all another form of intermediary, but bringing together um, people that are selling or buying products and services or that have innovations they want to distribute to users. And we have companies in the middle that are in many ways, the most wealthy and valuable and powerful companies in the world. We call these hybrids, Apple, Google, Microsoft, uh, Facebook, Amazon. They have both innovation and transaction platforms in their portfolios and they link them in, in very powerful ways. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, let's uh, go down for the three points I want to make here. So we, we talk a lot about what these different types of platforms have in common. Uh, they're trying to bring together two or more market sites, users and uh, innovators or buyers and sellers, of course. Uh, their unique value comes from the feedback loops the and uh, the positive feedback loops from bringing these sites together, what we call network effects. Direct would be user to user, for example, but user to innovator it would be an indirect or cross-side network effect. We talk a lot about how you get started. There are many of these platforms are launched. Many of them never get beyond a critical stage. We call that the, the chicken or egg problem. And how do you really get those uh, value uh, network effects going? And click on one more time. Um, and again, <laughs> That's the problem with animation. It's, it's a very complicated business model, very different from traditionally just selling a product or service where you control everything that happens to it. And that's why we say it's like playing three-dimensional chess. So it does take a different kind of logic and strategy and organization to make platform businesses really work well. Next slide, please. So, and we can click through all the points here. So let me just give you some data here that we, we, we studied existing platforms uh, when we started the book in 2015 and in internet uh, services and smartphones and personal computers uh, from the Forbes Global 2000 list. So these were big uh, publicly listed companies that were successful. And so what we found uh, compared to a control group of 100 firms in the same uh, set of industries, but who that were not trying to build a business around network effects. Uh, the platforms and the non-platforms had about four and a half billion dollars in revenues, but the platform companies had half the number of employees, twice the sales growth rate, uh, almost twice the operating profits and about three times the market value. And again, this was because they're leveraging essentially the ecosystem, supply, side is really coming from outside. And so, yes, we can go to the next slide. So these are incredibly valuable companies if you can get this far and you can scroll through all of them, Robert, thank you. But there's lots of problems with that. And let's hold this for a minute. So there's problems with user data and security, illicit usage. Look what happened with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica in the presidential election. We have antitrust actions against every major platform uh, the powerful ones in the United States and in China in particular, and then actions in Europe. We have a lot of these platforms that seem to skirt uh, local regulations. You know, is Uber a taxi company? It says it's not, it's a smartphone app. 
Whereas Airbnb, a hotel company, they say, no, they're again, just an intermediary. They're a platform. You know, is Google or, or Facebook, are they publishers? Is Amazon a store or is it a platform, a marketplace? So we don't really have the laws. And in some cases, we don't even have the concepts to regulate uh, these types of companies. And many of them rely on uh, contract workers that they say are independent, they're not employees. And this is a great benefit to their cost, but is it actually fair to the workers? And then the, the final problem we talk about in the book is what we call platform mania, that the business models of many of these companies are very bad. Some of them are extraordinary, like Amazon. But platformizing a bad business that really relies on venture capital to subsidize these sides coming together is really a bad business. And that's an Uber, for example. And in that case, the bigger you get, the more money you lose. And Uber is still trying to get out of that dilemma. Let's go to the, the next slide, please. So here's the challenge, and we can click through on this as well, that we have new platforms coming down the pike. Third point as well there. Um, so many of these new companies are combining innovation and transactions in complex ways. They're getting bigger and bigger, not smaller. And they're leveraging new enabling technologies, some of which we don't fully understand. Certainly artificial intelligence and machine learning are being used in all of these platforms. And so we see AI and ML coming into the home as well as the enterprise in the cars we drive. Uh, in our medical discovery uh, and treatment platforms as well for gene editing. And also in quantum computing, we're actually building platforms that will be very secure and maybe even an unbreakable. And that helps uh, on the good side of things if you wanna be secure financially, but it can also create terrible problems if people are trying to hide things like terrorism. So let's go to the next slide. So there's, there's a lot to think about and um, we have a guest speaker today, keynote speaker, that should help us think through these issues. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia. My Italian upbringing helps me pronounce his name, I believe. But the Archbishop was born in Italy in 1945, obtained a degree in theology and philosophy from the Lateran University and also in pedagogy from the University of Urbino. He was ordained a priest in 1970, bishop in 2000. Uh, from 2002 to 2014, he was president of the International Catholic Biblical Federation. From 2004 to 2009, he was chairman of the Commission for Ecumenism and Dialogue of the Italian Episcopal Conference. Since 2019, he's been president of the Family International Monitor. And in June 2012, Pope Benedict XVI elevated him to the position of archbishop and appointed him president of the Montifical Council for the Family. The list goes on. In 2016, he was appointed president of the Pontifical Academy for Life and the Grand Chancellor of the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and the Family. Uh, for his work in peace, he received in 1999, the UNESCO uh, Gandhi Medal. And then in February 2019, the Archbishop uh, co-signed a, a declaration, the Rome Call for Ethics and Artificial Intelligence. And that will be the subject of his talk today. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce the Archbishop. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Cusmano. It is a very great pleasure for me to participate uh, at this meeting. And uh, let me begin, ladies and gentlemen, by acknowledging and thanking all of you who have gathered to hear an appeal that is addressed to the world human community. In fact, it is my intention today to launch such an appeal in the hope that you will actively endorse and contribute to it. The world is currently experiencing the change of an age. And we are more aware of the change than ever. Than ever. While humanity has lived from the period of with a technological innovation that is particularly disruptive, but in the pace 
which it is ever faster and uh, in its pervasiveness as it directly touches the life of not only individuals, but of all society as well. I'm referring to emergent and convergent technologies that allow us to intervene deeply within living matter, acting on the molecular basis of the human body. These technologies even lead us to the question of human life itself, changing our understanding of it and opening the possibility of modifying it as well. Within this framework, we cannot avoid our responsibility for preventing disastrous outcomes. How can we stop humanity from becoming merely technological and instead humanized technology? How can we avoid being controlled by an algocracy that is by the power of data and algorithms? Shouldn't we de develop a vision of society and of the future of our planet where humans are the masters and not slaves? First of all, I think, I think it is important to avoid giving doctrinal or authoritarian power to either government or private business interests. But this avoidance is possible only if ethics is given a role, not only when a product is built and in the box with nothing left to be done, but to try to regulate its use. Rather, ethics should have a role during the whole process of research and development. In other words, it is not enough to try to regulate technological devices themselves, leaving to the end the user to the decision <clears throat> on their proper application, one based on abstract and generic considerations of respect for individual rights and dignity. After the fact, experience tells us records to ethical principles. Once a technology exists, is almost useless. Words such as dignity, justice, subsidiarity, and solidarity, the principles that underlie the social teaching of the Catholic Church are never to be abandoned. The complexity, moreover, of the contemporary technological world guarantees that without the guidance, these principles, these principles provide fruitful dialogue among those who inhabit that world will be very difficult to establish. We need an ethics that influences the criteria that underlie both algorithm design and the responsibilities of those who participate in the various stages of algorithm formulation. In my opinion, ethics is called to accompany to entire management cycle of data and the production cycle of technological devices, starting with the choice of projects in which to invest. This is possible if we identify an interdisciplinary ethics model in which different skills play a role in each phase of product development. That is research, design, production, distribution, individual and entity use. The goal 
in the new era of artificial intelligence is to ensure skilled and shared oversight of the process that govern the interaction between human and humans and machines. At this point, data become all important and with them, so do you work and your accountability. You must never forget that behind the 400 hours of images uploaded every minute to YouTube behind the to behind the 2,5 petabytes of information collected every hour by uploaded every day on Facebook. There are really people. The photographs they post with all the metadata of which they are mostly unaware are fragments of their lives. They memorialize moments of joy or anger. Every purchase made with a totally car, with, with a, a loyalty card is tied to slices of everyday life, precious and toilsome. They speak to us of care, resourcefulness, worry, sometimes great sacrifices, and we can forget that the data we collect and feed into artificial constructs are the traces of real human beings, even if we have no idea of who they are. Never forget that you profile real people, not mathematical models or simulations. The great ethical and legal debate about the facial recognition is a perfect example. From all the data, a face emerges, a face that is precious and repeatable, even let me say the word sacred. In the field of healthcare, the multiple sources of data the unimagined, at least the ordinary thinking possibilities offered by the cross analysis, the sensitivity of the information that is proceeds, processed, and the collection of management of consents, all show how caring for people and their history and keeping them safe especially moments of suffering, imposes on us the burden of making sense out of unavailable complexities. These are just two examples, but they provide both context and justification for our inescapable accountability as professionals. Careful, however, no one member of society can carry this burden alone. Dialogue and cooperation among all parties is essential to ensuring that the interest uniting them is that of keeping our common home safe and providing for peaceful coexistence within the entire human family. Today, there is no area of activity that can do without a global perspective, particularly where technology is concerned. Faced with the enormous challenges that the technology presents, we are asked to take a qualitative leap toward a peaceful future for our planet. Looking to history, we can see in today's analogy with what happened after the Second World War. After the dramatic experience of totalitarianism 
that had trumped on the dignity of peoples and uh, on their cultures, the world took that qualitative moral leap and produced the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Dear friends, we must not wait for a yet another moral disaster before we take action. We can and must take protective measures before something happens. As a human family, we must reaffirm and promote proactively the right of all peoples to live on this earth, this earth with data diversity and in peace. In light of this consideration, the Pontifical Academy for Life has begun a program of cooperation with a number of interlocutors, academics, civil society, and the technology producers. The Rome call for EIETICS announced in February 2020 was our first step in the face of changes brought about by technological innovation. The academic mission obligates us to respond. We study and take action in support of technological innovation that advances authentic human development and promotes the common good. We intend to pursue the possibilities for humanism adapted to the digital age. The first signatories of the Rome Call were two companies that shared the academics foundation principles. ABM, represented by its vice president, John Kelly III, and Microsoft, represented by its president, Brad Smith. Together with an international agency, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, in the person of its Secretary General, Ku dong -yu, and the Italian government. But the spirit of this call for commitment is not one of limitation in the number of participants, but rather of expansion. We want to create a movement that grows and attracts other, like public entities, non-governmental organizations, industries, the service sector, to provide an ethical orientation in the development and use of technologies derived from, from artificial intelligence. Firstly, the Roman Call recommends a new discipline, the ethical development of algorithms, or more simply, algorithms. algorithms. In, an, in an environment where different visions of the world and of humankind are continually in conflict, algorithms can be based on the common ground offered, offered by the Declaration of Human Rights. Secondly, the call focuses on education, understood as attention to the future and to the new generations who must be enabled to live an ethic of artificial intelligence in a conscious and a contemporary way. Lastly, the goal gives particular attention to rights. The development of artificial intelligence in the service of humankind and the planet must be
And sorry, ladies and gentlemen, we're just having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties. Uh, the uh, We are uh, live broadcasting from Italy, so just bear with us a moment while we wait on getting the uh, Archbishop back online. So, uh, Nino, is it possible you can uh, contact uh, the Archbishop and just let him know uh, that we had a, a little bit of a problem? Stand by. Um, excuse me, Robert, I was just in contact that they are trying to reconnect right now. That is great. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Nero. And a very good session so far. Uh, so we hope that uh, this is a, a great offering to our community to, to kick off uh, the keynote on the call for AI ethics, something that we hope that all our CDOs and data leaders are able to uh, get involved with and take advantage of and, uh, and come up with their own ethics for the, uh, their own organizations. So we'll stand by. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get the Archbishop coming in. Uh, just in the meantime, obviously, uh, there are uh, chat features and functions in the Hoover platform that we hope you'll be able to take advantage of. And uh, don't forget to uh, reach out to our partners uh, in the business, have a look at their uh, sponsored videos and their content uh, as you see fit. And if you have a need for a solution, remember our partners are part of the family too. So we look forward to uh, their continued support uh, as we uh, look to bring this back to MIT next year. So just waiting just to hear back. And again, this is uh, the MIT CDO IQ Symposium live streaming from Italy. Uh, and uh, we hope to be back on site next year at the uh, Boston Institute uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, one of the uh, buildings there that we're looking at to house all the, uh, the plethora of CDOs and data leaders that we know we've got. I don't think I mentioned it at the beginning, just in case you missed it. We've got 62 countries represented uh, of which uh, we just passed the mark of uh, over 2,000. I believe the goal was 2021. We have got 2,000 and uh, over 2,021 attendees, CDOs and data leaders for the symposium. Uh, so we certainly look forward to uh, each and every one of you uh, trying to make it uh, to the symposium next year. So mark your calendars. And Nino, uh, just as a FYI, we really do thank you for reaching out to the, uh, the Vatican and helping us uh, be able to pull someone in that. Well, you're reaching out to contact him. So ladies and gentlemen, just stand by while we have uh, we reacquire our signal with the, uh, uh, the Vatican and the Archbishop who is uh, currently experiencing some technical difficulties. Thank you, Tom. Looks like we're coming on now, so. Okay. Archbishop, we had lost you there. Okay, so we are connected uh, again. Welcome back, welcome back. The floor is all yours. Thank you, sir. I think the team will want to disturb us. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah, you awarded away, awarded away, continue. But I hope that is not, to, not we'll have all databases. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, can I continue? Yes, please, Your Eminence. Okay, yes. I was telling about uh, the uh, six principles for an ethics of artificial intelligence. And I started with the first one, uh, which called transparency. Transparency. In principle, artificial intelligence systems must be explainable. Two, inclusion. The needs of all human beings 
must be taken into consideration so that everyone can benefit and all individuals can be offered the best possible conditions in which to express themselves and develop. Three, responsibility. Those who design and deploy the use of artificial intelligence must proceed with responsibility and transparency. Four, impartiality. Do not create or act according to bias, do safeguarding fairness and human dignity. Five, reliability. Artificial intelligence systems must be able to work reliably. Six, security and the privacy. Artificial intelligence systems must work securely and respect the privacy of users. Our meeting today is at the beginning of a conference that will present significant reports and address important questions for dialogue. And uh, we will hear from recognized experts in the field. I would like to thank the organizers and all of you for giving me the opportunity to address you as you begin your work and to offer you a cultural framework within which to place the main issues you will discuss. May I close my remarks by leaving you a dream for the future. Pope Francis, in his encyclical Fratelli Tutti, which is dedicated to universal fraternity, writes, I quote, technology is constantly advancing, yet how wonderful it would be if the growth of scientific and the technological innovation could come with more equality and the social inclusion. How wonderful would it be even as we discover for away planets to rediscover the needs of the brothers and sisters who orbit around us. Pope Francis. Thank you, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, to hear me and to offer this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence, uh, for your and for the Pontifical Academy of Life uh, words and uh, to bring this ethical dimension into within the symposium sphere, within uh, our, uh, our framework and discussion, which, uh, which is, uh, I think, is a great, uh, great inspiring way to, to start this symposium. And uh, you did mention, we would like to, to, to just share with you your views on a few of the words you have uh, shared with us. And one is about the call. The call itself is based on uh, three kind of impact areas, and one of which is education. And obviously, being at this an MIT event, education is at core of uh, the business that we are today. So could you please expand on what are the, the kind of tech tactical uh, steps uh, and action that are being put in place in support to this area. And uh, if you are planning a collaboration with the existing uh, institutes and universities such as the MIT today. Okay, thank you. We are uh, initiating a series of links uh, with uh, IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, a global association that has also identified education as a many driver. In light of what we stated in the call, we are approaching education in three areas. The first concerns young people and the second, the elderly. These are two elements of society recognized as fragile with respect to the impact of digitalization and algorithmic profiling. The third area deals with 
engineers. We look to them to design user experience in ways that put humans at the center of it. As for our cooperation with uh, the a, a triple I, we are mainly active in promoting responsible design in artificial intelligence, favoring the practical realization of the principles of the goal. This step is only possible with organizations that deal with the actual engineering, that is with uh, those who are boots on the ground. As for the young and the elderly, a series of strategic links are in place, beginning with the most eminent academic figures, such as Michelle Gilman, Venable, professor of law at the University of Baltimore School of Law, who wrote a report for the Data and Society Research Institute about the impact of algorithmic decision making on the poor. <clears throat> Professor Gilman is among those who have signed the call. With respect to adolescents, we are in discussion with uh, Firefox and the Telefono, Telefono Azzurro, an Italian nonprofit created to defend the rights of children and with other child protection entities. In this sector, our action takes a threefold approach. We want to create user awareness. We want to create civil society awareness so that certain content does not go unnoticed. And finally, we want to raise awareness among organizations recognize that organizations are made up of people. For this reason, dialogue with chief data officers, as in this conference, is crucial. You can bring to your work the values that derive from having embraced even some of principle of the call. And you can see those values applied in our in your products from our dialogue with large companies in fact we see more and more the commitment and the purpose are important in the call the concept of uh, algorithmical vision is introduced in the est on approach of ethics by design based on these principles and the sponsor of the call expressed this desire to work together to promote algorithms. Thank you. Thank you also to, to stress the, the relevance and the importance of this uh, call. And uh, okay, I'm calling from Italy. I'm familiar with some of the organization we are currently working such as Telefono Azzurro, which is uh, just commending the, the great work is being done. And today we are obviously uh, launching a, a new connection with, uh, with MIT and uh, this symposium and this forum. Um, as for your, your last word, you, you did introduce this uh, neologism or this new word, alg algorithmical. So this is a part in the call is introduced this concept, which is an approach of ethics by design, as you have just mentioned which is based on uh, six principles and the sponsors of the call express their desire to work to promote together yeah. algorithms. So the ethical of uh, algorithms. And um, what are uh, the initiatives currently being planned in this direction? And if you could share with us and with the, with the forum a couple of uh, name or could name a couple, please. Okay, thank you for that question. I am happy to mention a number of the actions taken by the signatories of the room call, because seeing the way in which a proposal can be implemented can trigger that kind of chain reaction we are after. A first example comes from Microsoft Finland, which together with 
the Trade Union of Education, the Mannheim League for Child Welfare, and other government and the private entities has produced what is called the empathy packages. The problem to be addressed was online bullying, a social issue of which the Finnish are very aware, so much so that the president of Finland mentioned it in his 20, when 2020 New Year's address, emphasizing that the way people interact online is a question of mutual respect and a way to maintain peace and the social safety. Incentivized by its desire to solve the problem, Microsoft Finland carried out an extensive study that involved thousands of young people, parents and the teachers, as well as the experts in various fields. The result of their work is an online platform that is easy to find and use and that serves as the key source of content and the tools to enable stakeholders to decrease cyberbullying and learn digital empathy skills. Another example I would like to bring to your attention is IBM methodology for artificial intelligence fairness. In this case, it was a matter of becoming aware of the fact, of the fact that human bias can be injected in artificial intelligence models, which can then make decisions or recommendations that lead to discrimination. The follow the principle of the call, IBM wanted to make sure that uh, AI bias is detected and mitigated. To do this, the company decided to create an effective AI ethics panel, clearly define the company policies around AI, work with trusted partners and release an open source toolkit called AI Fairness, three, uh, Fairness Next 360, that allows developers to share and receive state of the art code and the data, data sets related to AI bias detection and mitigation. These are just two of the actions taken. With your help, many others will follow. I hope. We hope. No, uh, no thank you, Rekha. I think. Uh, alongside the the Rome call, this could be uh, our call for this uh, symposium. So I think touching on this point, and uh, thank you for sharing these uh, examples. And for ethical committee, something that is being discussed. We may have a few uh, speakers along these three days to also touch based on what their own organization have done. So is is a topic that is uh, getting close to the heart of people and to the to the program of people. So it's uh, more than a year, I think, is passed from uh, from the launch of the call in Rome. And uh, and you have already touched, but what should the people, we are more than 2,000 people today representing as many, almost as many companies. So what should people and organization do to join uh, the call and to be involved in the in the diffusion within their organization and broader than that more than a year has passed but we like the rest of the world have had our schedule disrupted by covid nevertheless in may 2021 we opened up our romcall.org site to allow both organizations and individuals to sign on to the goal. Our hope is that 
more and more people will join us. But it is not a game or uh, a mere formality. From those express an interest, we ask for a letter of intent, a description of the organization to which they belong, the reasons why they want to join the call. And later, we also are, ask for a description of the ways in which the principle of the room call have changed the organizational structures. Thank you, and uh, um, you have mentioned the, the, the site, and uh, hopefully we will be able, uh, alongside the recording of the session, also to share uh, the, the wording that you shared with us. So we will share, obviously, the, the website and the link to the call and, uh, and the request for this letter of intent, which is, which is an opportunity for organization to, to question and uh, ask why, why to, to adhere to such initiative. And uh, I think coming to, to the end of this session, one, uh, one question is, uh, has been crossing our minds and was the call is a global call. And uh, how do you intend to engage with uh, other religions uh, and uh, partner to ensure uh, the call is truly and fully inclusive? No, as a modernity has taught us, the welfare state is an uh, agreement to search for the good that is shared and shareable. The Rome call, although it has a religion among its promoters, the Catholic Church, is not the specific expression of a religion. It is rather an attempt to arrive at a social contract that can include religious values but also all the values that are found within companies and civil society. In the dialogues that we are conducting, we often meet interlocutors who speak of the values of justice, fairness, leaving no one behind and the desire for artificial intelligence to put humanity at its core. This happens in companies, in organization, and in the Abrahamitic religions, the three Abrahamitic religions, Jewish, uh, Muslims, and Christians. But we can think of Buddhists, Buddhists as well. In it, the idea of doing no harm is central. And that there is vast space for this idea with the call. Since the call is an outline for shared values, it should be understood as an instrument of common, of communion, rather than as a rule to be imposed. On this point, we are in great agreement with Jewish and Muslims, and we plan that in 2022, there will be an interreligious inter sign of the Rome call. This will be a first step, first steps toward dialogue with other religions. And we want to continue our effort in order to gather people, religious organization, to have uh, some moral guidelines in order to support a new humanist in this, uh, our planet. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Your Excellency. And uh, is, uh, we really look forward to this 2022 for uh, this multi-religious uh, sign. And obviously, uh, might be also the opportunity to, to have you over to this conference uh, next year to, to yeah. reinforce the call. Um, I just thank you and uh, your team for, put, for uh, coming and being uh, available, and uh, Monsignor Mensuali and the others. 
And I just hand over the word to Dr. Richard Wang for the official closing. Thank you again. Thank you. And if I may, I would like to thank your eminence on behalf of MIT and the symposium. Thank you so very, very much for your wisdom, your teaching, and your time to keynote this morning. And thanks to Nina. Ciao. Ciao, thank you very much. Bye-bye. So <clears throat> just as an FYI, as, a, as your MC, uh, we now are going to go to uh, our commercial early. Uh, we weren't really uh, sure of the, uh, how much time the Archbishop uh, uh, could give us. Um, I know there were uh, chats. Uh, there are questions asked in the chat box. Uh, we did have a look at them. Uh, quite a nice feature is that people actually voted on questions. So we would uh, implore you to uh, use the, uh, the Q&A feature in the uh, sessions for your chats. The track producers will be able to relay them to the speakers. So with that, uh, our next session starts at 10.15. Uh, so what we're gonna do is we've got a special uh, coming up during the breaks. Uh, so we're actually gonna uh, play you some videos from our partners uh, while uh, we while away the, uh, the time difference. It gives you a chance to grab a cup of coffee and uh, reconvene back uh, for your breakout sessions at uh, 10.15. So uh, we have tried to make this as flexible. You've got a great Hoover platform that you can interact with. So please go ahead and reach out to your fellow colleagues. I have a chat uh, and we will keep you posted and we will see you all in the breakout sessions uh, starting at 10.15. Thanks indeed. Tom, we can go to infomercial. It's important to remember your most sensitive data assets represent real people, people who are depending on you to protect their privacy. Organizations who remember this, who care enough to protect people's privacy, earn trust. And earn trust ultimately allows you and your organization to drive innovation in ways that benefit everyone, including improvements in patient care. value in all directions, you add value in all directions. Accenture, let there be change. It's time to be open, to unlock, unlimit, and unleash data. It's time to work together. Above all else, it's time to simplify. One place for all your data. One foundation for every workload, from BI to AI. One platform that runs where you run. One architecture that puts an end to the trade-offs and brings it all together. One lake house.
Data governance and intelligence is the key to enabling organizations to drive business value from their data. Organizations can transform compliance into data intelligence and create business value through operational best practices and centralized solutions. The MIT CDOIQ Symposium is the premier event for chief data officers to collaborate, share ideas, and discuss best practices. This is PwC's vision for analytics and AI transformation an end-to-end -end solution that can empower your business to extract more value from your data. Whether you're in the business of developing...